Connor is going to talk about the work they've been doing over in Africa, which is really important stuff because people don't really talk about that stuff in the septic community as much as they should because we get focused on especially our first world problems, I guess, um, here in America. And especially, in, we, we pay attention to Europe, but we never think about the other countries. And I think he has things to talk about that directly relate to what we actually are passionate about. So, Connor Robinson can come up here and give you his talk. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so this, this is going to be a friendly group. Got a nice, I don't know, I think uh, Patrick Stewart is doing something right now, and that's, so I appreciate all of you, <laughs> all the more. Maybe I'll leave a little bit early and go check that out. Um, all right, so I'm going to try and control both of these devices. I hope the stickers aren't too distracting because uh, this one's got my notes and this one's got the slides. All right, we've already gone through uh, the title, Science, the Wicked Witch of the West. Um, what we're looking at here is how cultural attitudes in Uganda, not just about science, but about religion, uh, about the West, complicates uh, several humanist efforts in Uganda, humanist education efforts. Um, what we can do from the states to support those efforts, assuming we want to, I certainly want to, and then also what we can learn from those efforts um, in order to apply to our work here. And I want to just clear something up. I can understand why some of you might be confused, but this talk is actually not about witches or alleged witches, although that is a part of the work that I do, and I will talk briefly about it at the end. I'm not talking about um, Leo Igwe's work uh, or the Ghanaian alleged witches, um, which is another uh, witch, is another aspect of um, the trip I just took and the work we just did over the past year, which I need to explain a little bit about. So I'm not an expert on Uganda, uh, but I feel at least a little bit qualified to talk about my experiences that I had there over the past year. Um, I volunteered there for two months, and I volunteered there as a part of Pathfinders Project, which was a year-long international service trip sponsored by Foundation Beyond Belief with uh, 10 projects in seven countries, and with the added goal of scouting out locations for launching a humanist service corps, a permanent international service initiative for the non-religious. I think it's somewhat embarrassing or sad or I don't know what you want to call it, but we should have one. Um, I'm disappointed that we don't have one yet, so we want to make, we want to make that available to the non-religious community. Not that there aren't other volunteering, skept or, um, secular volunteering avenues, but one that's explicitly guided by uh, our secular values. I think it's, it's an important opportunity to have available. So we volunteered at two schools uh, in Uganda. The first one was called Kasese Humanist Primary School. And it is directed by the gentleman you see in the middle there, Robert Buambale. And we volunteered there for five weeks. We taught, um, well, I'll get to that in a second. We also volunteered at Mustard Seed Secondary School, uh, which is in uh, Kamui, um, another location in Uganda. And in both of these locations, I taught English. Ben, uh, who will speak later on Monday, I believe, as part of the Ignite Skepticism section of talks, he taught science and mathematics. He's here in the lab uh, at Kamui, um, so the Mustard Seed Secondary School. Wendy, who's in yellow, uh, taught English as well as comparative religion. And um, this is us in the Kasese uh, Humanist Primary School Library. You can see there's a CFI poster on the bookcase. Um, this school has been supported by a number of organizations, Atheist Alliance International, CFI, JREF, to just to name a few, um, and they're doing great work, which I will get to. Michelle taught computers as well as English, and then we all taught um, a sort of seminar uh, in which we exposed uh, students to 
experimentation um, and guided them in applying the scientific method. Uh, in this picture, we're working with students from Mustard Seed Secondary School to run through one of the JREF classroom kits. I don't know if any of you are familiar with those, but uh, JREF puts out free resources, and one of them it allows and guides um, teachers or any group organizer through the process of experimenting to see if dousing actually works. Um, so either using a pendulum or a rod to find whatever you want, usually water, but we have the embarrassing fact that in the United States some school districts use dousing to try and find marijuana in lockers as well. <clears throat> yep, that actually, that actually happens. Now, um, there are many admirable things about the Ugandan education system. And my point is not to um, present a holistic critique of the Ugandan education system at all. One of the things we really enjoyed, and by the way, I'm an elementary special education teacher, so I brought that perspective as I was traveling. Um, one of the things that I really enjoyed about the Ugandan education system at every school we visited, aside from the two that we volunteered at, was that they had this consistent, system of um, formal debates. And that's what's pictured here. You have a student presenting for the proposition in this case, and uh, presenting his points. They, they follow uh, Robert's Rules of Order. Um, it's, it's actually quite entertaining to watch, and they even asked us to participate in a few debates, um, which was fun as well. Uh, additionally, Although I think there's an overemphasis in teaching on rote memorization, that does lead to them, I would say, performing better in certain subjects than we do. Um, there are certain areas of mathematics and the sciences and geography, that's a particular weak spot in my education, uh, where I think they, they're doing better. And their um, system of testing um, is also, I would say, better than ours. Um, but their expenditure of resources, uh, well, their government expenditure of resources is not, I think, distributed always as it should be. And this sign is meant to illustrate that. Uh, this sign is close to my heart as a special education teacher. And I saw no evidence of special education as we were working in either of the schools we worked at. But I'm also not here to talk about special education, more so about the way the government um, works uh, its hands into a different aspect of education, the religious education, which I'll get to in a minute. First, in order to tell you about how the cultural attitudes are affecting science or humanist education efforts, I want to tell you what those efforts are. So I've already mentioned Kasese Humanist Primary School, and that is supported by, or it's sort of the prize gem of the Kasese United Humanist Association, KUHA. Uh, they have other initiatives, but that's their main one. Then the Uganda Humanist Schools Trust is a British organization that supports the Mustard Seed Secondary School, which I already also mentioned. And they support several other schools, uh, including the uh, Isaac Newton High Schools, um, which, are do excuse me, which are doing very well. Then there's the Humanist Association for Leadership, Equality, and Accountability. They work directly in the slums of Kampala to do not just um, education, but um, really social work. Um, they're working with the, the neediest uh, and highest risk um, teens in Kampala. Then there's the Uganda Humanist Association. They also work in Kampala and um, an organization called the Humanist Empowerment of Livelihoods in Uganda, again, in Kampala. Not a humanist organization, but um, also worth mentioning is Free Thought Kampala. So there's a lot of work going on in the capital. It's harder to work in the rural areas, uh, but there is, I would say, in, f in six organizations that I can just mention off the top of my head, that seems like a lot of promise, given what we might be hearing about Uganda in the news. Um, so there is progress being made. There is good work being done. But what is the resistance to this humanist work being done? Let's take a look. So, I think one point that's pretty easy to point, pretty easy to bring up when you're talking about resistance to 
science education, um, and that goes hand in hand with the resistance to, to science educa education is what we all, or we in America, probably have most in our minds when we hear about Uganda. And that's the popularly titled Kill the Gays Bill, right, which was just passed last year. Uh, this is the first um, really explanatory paragraph of the Kill the Gays Bill. Fortunately, uh, it's no longer effectively a bill that results in the execution of queer individuals in Uganda, but it can result in lifelong imprisonment and it can also result in a near, uh, nearly a decade of imprisonment just for people who speak out in favor. Um, this bill was passed in 2013 and then was thrown out on a technicality, so it's likely that it will come up again, uh, but it, it just points to what the environment is. And as I said, uh, the Anti, the, the homophobic attitudes in Uganda go hand in hand with some of the anti-science attitudes, which is why I bring it up. Now, this despite the fact that the constitution of Uganda very clearly says, there shall be no adoption of a state religion. Uganda shall not adopt a state religion, clear. That there's a freedom from discrimination, that there's equality, um, and it even specifies religious equality and religious freedom as well as no discrimination based on uh, gender identity or sexual orientation. And then, um, you know, this is more in support of that. And a lot of the language here you'll recognize as being similar to some of the language they, that we have in our own constitution, after which it was modeled. And with regard to education, uh, and with regard to non-discrimination in education, uh, you would think that religion should not really enter in the classroom either. But that's not at all the case. And that's not, it's not at all the case that religion doesn't enter in the, into the government, as we've seen with the uh, Kill the Gays bill. So if any of you have seen the wonderful documentary God Loves Uganda, you know that much of the effort to push the anti-gay bill and to push homophobia in Uganda comes from American missionary efforts, American evangelicals. Really all of the money and um, all of the organizing started from American evangelical groups. Uh, one of the main men behind these groups, Scott Lively, has now been indicted for crimes against humanity, uh, but we'll see if anything happens with that the damage has already been done. I mean, the law is no longer on the books in Uganda, but queer individuals are still being burned alive, beaten alive, or beaten to death in the streets. And uh, there are still people who are publishing lists of, uh, and addresses and pictures of queer individuals in Uganda. And it doesn't matter if their accusations are right or wrong, the people on the list are being killed. This is, uh, we did some Q&A sessions in um, Mustard Seed, at Mustard Seed School, and I found this one disturbing and entertaining at the same time. If you look at the question, uh, uh, question number three, disturbing and entertaining, why do gays have rights, yet it seems to be a bad thing? Um, that was a question we had to answer in, uh, in, Kasset, or in um, Kamuli at Mustard Seed Secondary School. Is it true that in some states of America, people of the same sex marry each other? Now, the, the evangelical effort in Guatemala doesn't surprise me that much. Nor does it surprise me that there's now a reverse evangelical effort where people from uh, Africa, Uganda included, think that, or they, they look at the, de the media depictions of America and they think that America is lost to the devil and so now they are bringing the right religion back to America. So they're, mi they're bringing their missionaries to, over to us. But the thing that just flabbergasted me when I, when I first heard this was that the missionaries, the, the evangelicals who came over and spearheaded this homophobic movement in Uganda also managed to convince the Ugandans that they weren't the ones trying to convert anybody that it was liberals coming over who were trying to convert Ugandans to homosexuality. And like I said, that just took me aback. But so the, the missionaries, the evangelicals who are traveling to Uganda have, have convinced the Ugandans that they are not the ones doing the 
evangelizing, doing the proselytizing. It's people like me coming over to do service work and, who are telling them that we're okay with, you know, homosexuality, and who are, who are really trying to change the true values of Ugandan society. Uh, and so those, those questions also came up. Now, it's not just in the questions the students asked, it's not just in the legislature, it's in the classroom by mandate of the federal government. In order to pass seventh grade, well, the equivalent of seventh or eighth grade for us, P7, uh, students have to take Christian religious education as they do every year, uh, or religious education. It's either Christian or Muslim, you have the option. And you can see, this is the teacher's textbook. This is the teacher's guide. Uh, I hope you can read it on the monitor. Uh, but if not, I will read you just some choice bits. The P7 Christian religious education syllabus has one theme, Christians and the Holy Spirit, which is broken down into topics that are taught throughout the year. An attempt has been made to create a bond between Christians and the Holy Spirit in all aspects of their lives. This isn't comparative religious education. This is indoctrination. And this is in the classroom of a country that has a constitution that says they shall adopt no state religion. Uh, term one, just to give you an example, is about the Holy Spirit. God's Holy Spirit in us as Christians is our greatest gift. When we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, we receive the gift of the gi and the giver because the gift is the giver. I'm just going to let that speak for itself. Now let's look at some of the exams. I, I'm sorry to go through this in length, but I just want to give you a real feel for what the problem is. Um, here's a question from a primary three. So uh, this is more like uh, second, third grade. Examination. An official test. Who is our savior? So not who do the Christians believe is the, the savior, Messiah, whatever, but who is our savior? Jesus. Now this student only got 58%, which leads me to believe that this was not a weighted question. But um, it seems to me that it's probably the most important one. I would have given him more credit. Name two things created by God. Well, that's just not even a rigorous question. The th just offends me on multiple levels. <laughs> Draw these things God created. Where, I wonder, are the viruses and parasites? They're not being drawn. Now it's interesting, as I mentioned, that they have the cho students have the choice to go either the Muslim track or the Christian track. And the questions for these are presented side by side. The students only have to answer one or the other, and whichever one it seems, like if they choose to answer both, they'll only be graded on one, probably the first one. Um, now here, on this page at least, it seems to be a little more balanced. You could almost swing this as more of a comparative religion test, although I think it would be much better if they were actually asked to compare and contrast and talk about differences, similarities, etc. That's actually higher level critical thinking skills. But then when you, when you continue into the test, you see it's, it's not that at all. Uh, which ceremony helps us examine our lives in the light of faith through the death of Jesus? Um, Compare that to the next question for the Muslim students, and you see, even though that there is a nod to Islam in uh, Uganda, it's still, like, Christianity is what's preferenced here. There's no we, our, my, me in the, in the uh, Muslim questions. The only people who are seen as accepted as part of the norm are the Christian students. Which ceremony helps us examine? Name three ways we meet Jesus in our daily life. I dance, singing, praying. Now this student should have gotten credit for dancing. I dance, he just didn't have the parallel structure. But if you can meet Jesus by praying and singing, I assume you can also meet him by dancing. <laughs> Maybe. 
<laughs> Dancing is of the devil from the audience. Now, those were all religious education texts. These are from the religious education curriculum. This is a passage from, the, from one of the most popular English textbooks for high school. So this is a passage in English literature class. But you can see this is further indoctrination. Some believe, some people in the world believe in one of the major world religions, such as Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, and Buddhism, while others believe in less, less well-known religions. Each of these religions views God differently in terms of what God is like and what he is capable of doing. Well, that's a pretty dishonest shaping of the conversation from the get-go, I would say, based on my understanding of world religions. Um, what is your religion? How does it view God? Mm, again, troublesome. So you can see, and the rest of this passage is no better. Uh, in fact, it's quite offensive in my opinion. The topic, to the title of this passage is traditional religion. And then the entire content goes to just show how awful traditional religion is. That was the purpose of the author. And then it, it tries to, sh to warp traditional religion so that it's all somehow about this omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent deity, which we would recognize as the deity from Christianity. Uh, but the author was warping it so that the students are blinded to their own cultural history. So I wasn't going to give you the entire passage, but it was awful to read through with the class. Now, that's the situation. And it may seem pretty discouraging, but what can we do about it? I want to remind you that there are several incredible organizations on the ground in Uganda uh, promoting, I mean, they're not promoting humanism in the sense of proselytizing, but they, they're doing humanist work, and they're promoting an education that looks critically at the curricula, rather than just presents the curricula dogmatically, which is important. They have no choice but to work with the religious education curriculum, but they can present it in a way that students are um, prompted to question. So who are those groups? I already told you about them. Let's go through one by one with pictures. This is a picture of uh, the Kasese Humanist Primary School campus, which occupies abandoned railway property, abandoned Ugandan railway property. So you can see that if you look on the other side of that building is where the trains used to come through. And even as beautiful as that picture is, you can probably also see how run down that building is. That building, which is the best building left on the property, is not even used by the school. This is used by a, uh, a nurse a medical facility. Um, the rest of the buildings are in even worse shape. Now, these are some of the wonderful Kasese Humanist Primary School students, but you can see behind them, these are the classrooms. So the windows are broken. Uh, some of the doors work. Uh, the walls are corrugated metal, so the classrooms get incredibly hot. They're, the desks are uh, falling apart, and they're these pew-style, incredibly uncomfortable desks, not enough space for writing, for working, for collaborating. Um, and then the chalkboards are, um, they're, they're so impossible to erase that you can't even really write your new lessons on them. So that's the situation there. Fortunately, uh, Robert Wambale, is just, he's, a, he's a steam train, constantly moving forward. He purchased land for a new site. They're building on that new site. These, this, these pictures are from construction on the new site, which I haven't switched yet for you. And you can see the difference. I mean, look at how large that is. The classrooms uh, on the railway site are maybe um, 10 by 8. We have windows and electricity. Uh, we have desks that allow for collaboration between students rather than before where you just had the chalkboard and then you had pews. And that leads to a teacher-centered lesson. Here you have student-centered lessons. This is the nursery which was the first building completed and which is why they've actually already started nursery schooling at the new campus. <clears throat> this is the vocational school that they're building. Now this is, well, let me just go back to that for a second. Uh, so one way that you can support 
Ugandan humanist education is by directly supporting the schools. And I would encourage you, if you are interested, to take a look at the Kasese Humanist Primary School uh, website. Or to take a look, uh, there's a particular blogger that just loves Kasese Humanist Primary School. His name is Sean McGuire, and he, he blogs at My Secret Atheist Blog. And um, check out his, his pictures and, and the work that's going on there. There's also, this is, well, while it's loading, there's also the Mustard Seed uh, Secondary School, and they, too, need money. Uh, the, the thing is that right now, I would say their limitation is with regard to teachers. Um, they don't have the teachers, whereas Kasese does, who are qualified to really provide that comparative religious framework uh, or um, to, to teach biology in a way that goes beyond the Ugandan biology curriculum, which is necessary because the, bio, the Ugandan biology curriculum, you can imagine, it's still spinning. This might be an issue. Well, we got that. Um, this is a picture from Halia, the, uh oh, well, it's an important organization working in the slums of Kampala. Uh, and unfortunately, if any of you are on CFI's emailing list, you will know that their office was just robbed and they lost everything that they had. And so a, a fundraising effort is currently being spearheaded by Share which is the CFI fundraising mechanism. I believe it stands for Skeptics and Humanists Aid Relief Effort. Uh, so if you're interested in getting them back on, up, up on their feet so they can continue doing their work in the slums of Kampala, you can also do that. Now, those aren't the only ways to help. Um, you can also spread the word. A lot of people, when, you're, when you tell them these things, that, that this is what's happening, they're surprised. So this is what religious education looks like in Uganda. If you tell them that students are asked who their savior is on an official test in order to pass seventh grade, not just seventh grade, every grade prior to that and every grade after that, I think that would surprise most people. Maybe not, but you can spread the word about what the situation is and also spread the word about what's being done so that even if you're not in a position to donate to these organizations or if you've already committed your money elsewhere, or your time elsewhere, I understand, other people might be interested, and spreading the word is just as important. You can volunteer. Uh, there are stateside volunteering efforts in support of these organizations, and all of them accept on-site volunteers as well. So uh, there, there are definitely situations where, volunteer, or where charitable organizations don't need volunteers. This is not one of them. We are in a we're in a position to provide expertise in areas of critical need for these schools with regard to computers, with regards to comparative religious education, the application of the scientific method, all of these things, very important, and we can provide that to them. Now, I want to uh, give you, I, I said I would take you through what the situation is, what's being done, uh, what the objections are to it, and what we can learn from it and how we can help. So here's what I think we can learn from it. And then I'll open for questions if we still have time. Perspective. Um, when I was leaving, when I was preparing to go to Uganda, I thought this was just going to be an utterly lost situation when, before I'd really done my appropriate research. But there are al there's already all these organizations on the ground doing this work. And they're doing fantastic work. And I had um, volunteers who identify as queer in my volunteering group. So there was actually a point as we were preparing to leave where we had to come together as a group and decide if we could still go. Because this was in the lead up to the passage of the Kill the Gays Bill. And we contacted uh, some LGBTQ activists in Uganda and some atheist activists in Uganda. And they helped give us some perspective. They reminded us, as um, Christians might remind us, uh, that we should you know, remove the rod in our own eyes, or our own eye before we worry about the pebble in others. Maybe I got that backwards. 
Anyway, that's a Bible quote from somewhere. Um, but the point being that we have a lot of violence and discrimination against um, queer individuals in the United States. And in some cities, the situation is actually more dangerous than in most cities in Uganda. So that was a, an important perspective. And that's the case we found in Uganda as well. So perspective. Um, I'm not someone who says that we should pick our battles, although I also think that's a good point. Uh, even though I identify as a humanist, and many of you might identify as skeptics, I think we have the same battle. What I would say is that it's important for all of us to pick how we battle. We share this battle, but I think it's important for us to remember that direct confrontation, when there's no arbiter, is oftentimes counterproductive. So unless you have someone deciding who's winning and who's losing, most likely if you're in a direct confrontation, you are losing. Because if your goal is to convince the other person of your side, once you get into that battle mode and once they get into that battle mode, your brain and their brain has shut down any, any of the faculties we have, which are already limited, for taking in new information and processing new information that contradicts our own beliefs. So when I say pick how you battle, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be fighting superstition, we shouldn't be fighting homophobia, we shouldn't be fighting anti-science education in Uganda. I'm saying that the way to fight that here and the way to fight that in Uganda is sometimes through the softer approach. It's sometimes through buddying up to people first, no matter how disagreeable that might be, uh, in order to, to reach a level of communicative trust that you can actually discuss the difficult issues. We had conversations with devoutly religious people who had previously believed that all atheists had horns and were terrible people about our atheism, but it wasn't the first conversation we had. Those conversations ha happened after we built up a foundation through shared service and enabled those conversations to be, conversations to be uh, successful. Because when people have conflicting beliefs, I mean, there are people, and well, we all do it, we do exist with conflicting beliefs, but when we are forced to confront the fact that we have conflicting beliefs, generally, we let one fall and we keep one. So, all atheists are bad, this atheist seems to be a good person, which one's gonna fall? Well, you go with what's in front of you. Pick how you battle, don't pick what your battles are. Because I share that battle with you, but I'm gonna continue doing the slightly softer approach. Um, now, this is a discouraging situation. Life, America, the world is a discouraging situation. Uh, at the end of our trip, Pathfinders Project, we were asked if we still had any hope for the world. And that's a good question. I'm not sure that if you look straight on at the black hole of awful uh, things happening that you can, but the truth, the, the truth is that we can only do what we can do, and just as in teaching, I'll use a teaching analogy, when you don't just say, okay kids, we're gonna get from here to 100% proficiency, you say we're going to get from here to 5% proficiency, then 10, 15, 20, you set incremental objectives for yourselves and for your students. So we move this mountain, again, to go with an unfortunately Christian analogy, I apologize. We move the mountain of hopelessness pebble by pebble with small successes in the areas we can control. Uh, I can't control what happens in Uganda, but I can support in some small way organizations who do have a bigger impact there. Now, I promised I would talk about witches at least at the end and I realized I'd forgotten to do so. So I'm gonna go back to point two just for a minute as an illustration of picking how you battle. Uh, as I mentioned, the Pathfinders project was in part an exploratory trip to find a location for launching the Humanist Service Corps. We'll be doing that this summer and the location we picked is in northern Ghana where the problem is women usually after they are seen as having outlived their purpose to society aka after they're no longer able to rear children or produce children and after they no longer have male relatives to protect them are accused of witchcraft beaten, killed, or exiled from their communities. In Ghana, you have the somewhat fortunate situation that there's a parallel belief that there are areas of land that can strip the women of their powers, so they're permitted to move to these areas of land, albeit without any of their property or their family, uh, 
rather than being killed as they are in other countries like Senegal and the Ivory Coast. So how do you, how do you, what are we going to do there? Are we going to fight the superstition head on? Well, I would like to. Like I said, I share the battle of skepticism that I think this superstition is causing harm and that we should try to undermine that superstition if we, as, if we can. But I don't think you can do that by hitting it straight on. And there's an illustrative example in Ghana in that in Accra, where the same percentage of people believe in witches and witchcraft, you don't have the accusations. In fact, in nine out of the ten regions of Ghana, there aren't witch camps and there aren't accusations. It's only in the least developed region that you have these accusations and that you have these camps. So this points to the power of development. In an area where people understand the mechanism that mosquitoes play in transmitting malaria and then where they understand that you go to the hospital, you get the blood test and you get the medicine and where those things are available, when people get malaria, when malaria season hits, you don't have accusations. But in the north, when malaria season hits, the rate of sending women to these camps doubles because they don't understand the mechanism and they don't have the systems in place to care for people with malaria. So, when I say pick how you battle, what I mean is go in and develop, provide the health care, provide the education, provide the mosquito nets, and then you take away, you shrink the area in which the superstition, the superstition has to operate. They'll still have the superstition most likely. 80% of Ghanaians believe in witchcraft. That's a bigger, longer term goal to get that out. But you can at least get them to the point where they're no longer seeing the tragedies in their lives and then accusing all the people around them in such a way that they get killed or have human rights abuses committed against them. So that's all I mean there. Now finishing on that light note, are there any questions? Do we have time for questions? We have a timer right up there. Oh, that's beautiful. OK. Yes? Hello. Okay. Um, I just wanted to know, when you were talking about helping by um, sending funds, is there also a means to send other uh, forms of like literature or textbooks to the kids that they'd have access to? Because I know that um, uh, a lot of schools, when they, you know how they'll do like a new version of a biology book, for example, they'll take the old version and they'll either send it back to the publisher or they'll like donate it forward to places that don't have access to the newer version. So maybe is that something that would help, do you think? And is there a mechanism in place to, for those types of donations um, for the kids to have access to different kinds of information for scientific education? Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Um, and I would love to see it happen. I know that there are organizations that have organized uh, book, book drives, and specifically science literature. Um, for these schools. The one limiting factor there, the one obstacle there, is in order for this literature to be used and to not just sit in boxes, the teachers and the administration have to see it as um, meeting the, uh, the curriculum guidelines, right? Um, if the books, if they're American books, I see that there would be, or I predict that there'd be hesitation in using them because the way they interface with the tests is not as easy. Um, if we could develop, this is less, this is less simple, but would require a few more steps, but if we could develop a guide um, for teachers to use uh, in presenting the text that they have, I think that would potentially be more helpful. Um, and more helpful in the sense that it would be more likely to be used. Because when you're considering how to get teachers to implement things, this was, my, this was my frustration, my nightmare as a special education teacher. I didn't have my own classroom, but I worked with colleagues, and my job was to try to get them to implement the accommodations and modifications that they knew were the right things to do in their classroom. But getting someone to agree, hey, this biology textbook is way better than the one we have, and then getting them to actually use it in the classroom when they're just trying to get their kids to do well on the test, unfortunately that's the reality, uh, is another matter. So we need to figure out ways to, um, to, be real to, to, to work within 
the realistic uh, limitations we have. So yeah, maybe giving them a toolkit or a guide for using the flawed text that they have would be something we could do. How do the people in Uganda and specifically government officials reconcile the disparity between the way that the Constitution is written in such a way that uh, the government is supposed to be secular and this infusion of Christianity into the education curriculum? <laughs> so, so far, I mean, I, I tried to have this conversation and they make no effort to. They don't see the problem. Uh, I, actually, it is a lot like the way we do because the motto of Uganda is for God and my country, right? And so, you, I mean, I, I, I read through uh, the Ugandan constitution when I was there because I was so curious about this. But yeah, for God and my country, Uganda shall, have, shall adopt no state religion. I just, I, and I had this conversation with them. They don't, they don't make an attempt to reconcile it. They don't see the problem. Uh, we see the problem because we've been raised in this culture of understanding that um, religion shouldn't enter into the classroom. But I don't know. The other problem is that the, the Ugandan constitution, if you read through it, has a lot of promises made, but they have nothing in the constitution about which bodies will enforce the promises that are made. They have promises about um, diversity within the legislature and diversity within all aspects of government, et cetera, and non-discrimination, but there's no body to enforce these aspects of the Constitution, and I think that's, that's really the, the major issue there. Hi, uh, this might be a little tangential to what you're mostly talking about, but I'm just very curious, um, in, in a lot of um, hyper masculine or hyper macho societies, there's a lot of laws or social taboos like this. Uh, but in those same societies, there's a lot of men having sex with men. It's, you know, just under the surface. Uh, and so I'm wondering, is that the case here? Or is this sort of a new hysteria? Or is this something, um, I mean, uh, you, you know, do, do, do you, I'm not sure exactly what I'm trying to ask, but like I said, I've lived in places where, where this is really, really taboo, and it happens all the time. You know, gay sex is happening all the time. Nearly everybody does that, but it's on the down low, so to speak. And I just wonder if that's the situation in Uganda. Yeah, I mean, it definitely happens, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, and there, <laughs> there's some really interesting ways that people in Uganda try to explain it away. Uh, one of them, and this is an explanation that exists in the textbooks, in the religious education textbooks, is uh, either that it's um, part of the failure of the dowry system or the, the crumbling of the dowry system. Another one is that it's, w it's white people who come and pay Ugandan men, poor Ugandan men, um, who would otherwise not compromise their morals. Um, so yeah, but it, it has always existed and it continues to exist, but it's seen as um, not true to the nation's founding principles and morals and as something that undermines the strength of the nation. Right, so, so what I'm getting at is are, are people using it, using the things you just explained as justifications for their behavior? Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Mm, I, I can't, I'm not sure. I haven't, I, <laughs> I'm not sure I could get a Ugandan man <laughs> who, who bought into the hyper macho, hyper masculine uh, culture to admit that to me. Um, but so I'm, I'm for sorry, I'm not sure what they would explain it away as. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, you had spoken a little bit, I mean, obviously a lot, about um, the education materials that they're using and how they're teaching the children, but could you speak a little bit more about how um, this religious education is being received by the children or how they're reacting or their behavior about all of this, their attitudes? Yeah, they see no issue with it. They receive it unquestioningly. I mean, this is just the way it is, and the vast majority of them are Christian or Muslim. Um, there, there is a distinction, I would say, in the way it's received by Christian students versus Muslim students. Um, 
Most schools in Uganda are explicitly Christian schools, again, despite the fact that there's supposed to be no state religion. But there's also the freedom, um, and it was represented in one of the slides that I showed of the Constitution, of any nonprofit group to form their own school, which is why you have these humanist schools, and which is why you also have uh, Muslim schools. And the reason why the Muslims founded their schools isn't exactly the same as why the, the humanists would have, um, but they, are, they do um, see themselves as being not treated fairly by the curriculum as well. But for most students, it's, this is just, I mean, it's, it reminds me of the David Foster Wallace joke or the one he used um, about the, the two fish who are swimming, the two like teenage fish who are swimming and they, they pass this old fish and the old fish says, hey boys, how's the water? And they keep going and he keeps going and then the one young fish looks to the other one and says, what the hell is water? You know, so you don't, you don't recognize the air you're breathing, the situation you're in. I don't think they question it. In the humanist schools themselves, there's a little bit more questioning, though, and that's why I think these are so promising, these humanist schools. Um, the, the, way the, the way the material is taught can change how students question it, um, or whether they question it at all. Hello, I was wondering, especially concerning science education, whether you see a transfer of knowledge from your students to the adults, and whether you think that's a viable option for public health education uh, projects. Generally or in Uganda? Either, both. <laughs> um, well, I see the internet as an incredibly powerful tool there. I think that we can certainly do that in the United States. That's this, I'm just really riffing. I'm not sure. I hadn't prepared an answer to that one, but um, I see that as totally possible in the US, using the internet and using social media to get to the kids first um, and then to send the message upward rather than sending the message downward. That system just really isn't in place in Uganda. Most of them. Uh, only access the internet on their phones and it's only the phones that give free access only for Facebook. So to that, to that degree that they have access, you could reach them through Facebook and that could be potentially pretty powerful uh, if you developed an app on Facebook that educated kids and also empowered them to educate the adults around them. I could see that working. Hey, uh, kind of in line with the, the title of the presentation, you obviously your, your major obstacle seems to be the, the overwhelmingly Christian atmosphere in Uganda, but obviously we have some of that here as well. Are there, in fact, elements either unique to Ugandan culture or their history of interaction with the West that also lead to a difficulty in accepting just even a scientific worldview or anything like that? Absolutely. Uh, you just reminded me of one of the biggest points that I neglected to hit in my talk. Thank you. Um, yeah, there's the, one of the reasons why there's such a resistance to science education is that it's seen as an arm of neocolonialism. So science education, it, it's not, it's, science isn't a process and it isn't the best process by which you know, we navigate the world as, as we see it. They see science as an, an alternative religion um, and an alternative religion that is set to undermine their values. And so this functions in two ways. There are the, the Christians who have been convinced that the kind of people who are bringing science are the kind of people who are bringing homosexuality. And so that's one reason to distrust science. And then you have, there, there's a healthy um, group of people who recognize that Christianity was a missionary force and a very destructive missionary force and they reject it. And they wanna go back to the traditional views, the traditional customs, but they also see science as attacking those. And so they, but in both camps, science is a competing religion and um, they want nothing to do with it for that reason. In fact, funny anecdote, uh, we had teacher, one teacher at 
the Kasese Humanist Primary School, who asked us, since we said we were humanists, this was past the uh, foundation for communication stage into the difficult discussion stage, and uh, she, she asked us, so are humanists like the priests of science? And are experiments like your rituals? Uh, do these like your magic, your, your religion's magic? And I'm not sure, I mean, we had a discussion about it and I think we made progress, uh, but I'm not sure how far we got there. So yeah, it's seen as a competing religion and we scientists are the priests of it. Uh, yeah, my question is, uh, how do kids end up enrolled in a uh, humanist school? You know, if you have this cultural background where science is seen as a competing religion or an external force, then I would expect that parents would not want their kids to be in the humanist school. They would want them to be in the Christian school down the road or the Muslim school or whatever. So what is the difficulty or the, the technique to convince parents that their kids should be in a humanist school? Well, transportation for these families is an issue. Uh, so in some sense, they're a captive audience. Now I'm not, that, that could be a bad thing. Uh, but in this case, because I don't think the humanist administrators are taking advantage of it, it's a good thing. Um, these families were wary at first. And the communities at large were wary at first. But with an emphasis on science and the role that science can play in future employment and um, future higher ability, uh, ability to make money. Um, in, these, uh, in these really impoverished communities, that ended up being a powerful argument for them. And when they saw that it wasn't a proselytic effort, I think a lot of their fears went away. When they saw that it was just an attempt at fixing some of the problems with education that did exist, um, and when those problems were pointed out to them, I think they were receptive to that information. Uh, that resulted in a, in a shift, of, um, shift of attitude on the part of the community, which is now, at, at least for Kasese and for Kamuli, which is where I have the most experience, um, these communities are very supportive of the schools now. Hi, um, most of your photographs are showing boys. Can you address what the role of the girls are in the schools? Yeah, um, gender dynamics in Uganda in general are very concerning. Uh, as I mentioned, there's still a dowry system in place. Um, many of the women we encountered argued vociferously for this dowry system, in favor of the dowry system. Uh, Women, even when they're not married throughout their entire lives, they're expected to uh, show proper honor to all men as stand-ins for their future husbands who will be paying this bride price to them. It's just simply what is owed to men. And that's uh, shown in serving food, in pouring water for them to wash their hands, things like that. And men don't pour water for women or serve them food. We tried and we were refused. Uh, and those dynamics also play out in the classroom. Um, and maybe my picture selection shows how they play out in my own head. Uh, but uh, in the classroom, uh, unfortunately, you, you do see a different treatment of female students by teachers and by their peers. Um, and participation in certain activities for women is discouraged, where it's encouraged for men. Um, in the pictures I showed, yeah, well, the only exception maybe being the, the uh, scientific method with the JREF classroom kit. I think that's mostly girls. Um, I don't know. We. The, the, the makeup of the schools themselves are not um, disproportionate, uh, but there are barriers to education for women, absolutely. Uh, one of the biggest barriers for education for women comes in the teenage years. Uh, so the, the lack of understanding about menstruation and about hygiene around menstruation 
uh, does affect. And the embarrassment that many um, teenage girls feel uh, about having to manage that at school ends up uh, really limiting the education of all African women, but um, in Uganda and Ghana, where I have experience, uh, severely decreasing the number of women in school past the age of 12. Um, so that, that could impact um, the pictures as well. I'm trying to think back on the pictures I showed, and then I think that may have had an impact. <clears throat> I've got three and a half minutes. Are there any other questions? Or do you want to? Have they thought of doing a, a girls' school with the humanist group? Ah, so the question is have they thought of doing a girls' school with the humanist group? Well, I don't believe they have. However, it's at the humanist schools that I see some of the greatest promise in terms of addressing that barrier. Uh, so there are much more private bathrooms. Uh, for the female students and there is a program aimed specifically at getting them the supplies they need to you know control their blood flow if they want to um, in multiple different options uh, and then giving them in a place a private place to dispose of them because that turned out to be a huge issue uh, the embarrassment of having to dispose um, the, the hygienic products uh, in sight of the boys ended up being a big issue that would just make female students miss a week every month for the entire school year. That's a lot of school. But so the humanist schools have strategies in place to mitigate those problems. Um, I don't know that there's been a discussion for, a, uh, for an all-girls school, um, but I, th I would support it, absolutely. How ubiquitous is the use of cell phones in the area you were? Right, so it's, it's very ubiquitous. Um, that's redundant. Uh, it's, it's ubiquitous. That's, that, that gets to, to, to Mike's question or point. Um, then when arguing what do humanists or the scientists bring compared to other religious, uh, see, seeing science as a religion, Whereas Christianity brings you witches and the devil, we bring you the cell phone and what comes with it. Uh huh. We had a yeah. Um, we had a debate, or one of the one of the debates that was hosted while we were there was called uh, "Resolved: Science and Technology Have Done More Harm Than Good." And so there's this there's this view by many that uh, the the drastic decrease in the average lifespan of um, an African individual is largely caused by scientific advances. And I'm not, I'm not sure precisely where that belief came or where they're getting their statistics about lifespans, but there is a belief that when they, when, when African, and this is coming from Uganda and Ghana, obviously, I'm not lumping everyone together, but um, that when the traditional beliefs and medicinal practices were followed, they were living up to 100 years, and that their crops were producing more. And they gave, these, they gave me these stories that were supposed to illustrate this fact, and so we had a discussion about anecdotal evidence, et cetera, and controlled studies, but point being that they see the uh, the advance of science as something that has actually undermined their progress. Um, and I'm not sure I have a, a dirt, an easy answer for how to go about counteracting that, but that's why they, they're not you know, really, really thankful for the cell phone or really, really thankful for the agricultural technology or whatever the case may be, because they actually think that we're taking them someplace worse. Okay, thank you. Thank you.